It is surreal to think Pitbull is going to feel this moment when Trackhouse wins their first NASCAR Cup Series championship this November. I know you want me to use that phrase. I know you want me to utter. Those words Larry Max says almost every single week on NASCAR race day, but I cannot. My lips are sealed. And that's mainly because it's trademarked exclusively for America's crew chief himself. Plus, unless you've been living under a rock these past couple weeks, you have witnessed the fireball of a performance the Trackhouse Entertainment Group has put on in the first five races. This two-car stable has had a lot of F-U-N fun in the first five races, and guys, it might be time to get ready to take this team seriously as legitimate championship contenders. So entering the 2022 NASCAR Cup Series season, the Trackhouse team was beginning its brand new era, the one sparked by Pitbull, also known as Mr. Worldwide. You cannot forget that. Mr. 305, or better say Mr. Worldwide. Because his acquisition of the Chip Ganassi Racing Team was living proof that he is plotting NASCAR domination, I will not hear otherwise. Still, not many had this team being the beneficiary of a spec style even playing field garage. Heck, I didn't even have the 199 winning a race or even making the participation trophy playoff grid. Because you know nowadays, NASCAR just hands out playoff spots like candy. And maybe that is because seemingly every major sponsor, either a part of Ganassi or Trackhouse, did not bring their big money to the race team and chose to dip instead. Monster and McDonald's went to 2311. Gear Wrench went to Stuart Haas. Clover and Camping World, meanwhile, left NASCAR team sponsorship entirely. Now, I have no clue why the good luck charm known as Clover left, but I think I have a pretty damn good reason to believe why Camping World Holdings decided to cut their funding like a malignant tumor. So that left Advent Health, Comscope, Tootsies, Freeway, and various one-off sponsors that have stepped up to the plate financially, but still, there is a good chunk of unsponsored races coming up in the second half. A bit of concern financially, but I doubt that hinders their ability to be competitive in this next generation era where costs are a lot lower than usual. So for the team's newly acquired number one entry, Justin Marks and Pitbull brought in the entire Ganassi 42 team to Trekhouse, including, of course, professional watermelon smasher, you know him by name, Ross Chastain. Now I know I chose Kurt Busch over Chastain in my Trekhouse debate over the one car last year, so here comes the another total L brigade, considering what has happened this season, but I don't care. The elder Bush brother was the better choice at the time, and I'd choose him again in a heartbeat. I'll do it again. Okay. You just cannot say no to a Cup Series champion that's still contending for wins and has some solid sponsorship. Though I'm going to admit, Chastain has set himself apart from previous young drivers that failed to rise to the occasion, and he is a strong alternative to the 2004 Cup Series champion. If you're still a bit confused, I'll explain why, as Daytona and Auto Club, not the hottest start for Ross Chastain as they both ended in crashes meaning the work for Las Vegas was a 9-5 grind. And boy did this Trackhouse number 1 team hit the jackpot on that afternoon. Ross Chastain would have a career day by leading 83 laps, the most of any driver in the field. A monumental accomplishment, and if you do not think so, you do not understand the power of the Pennzoil 400. I want you to take a long, hard look at this list of drivers that led the most laps in the spring Vegas races since 2016, and think back to what they did in those respective seasons. All of these drivers on this list right here won no less than four races, and three of which became the eventual season champion. Words cannot truly explain the magnitude of Ross Chastain being on this list. Meanwhile, Phoenix, yet again Chastain was mixing it up for the win, fine with Tyler Reddick and Chase Briscoe to become that elusive winner 200, falling just one spot short. Then last week at Atlanta, Chastain was leading, fell victim to Chevrolet's right rear tire problems before the end of stage one and looked to be well out of contention. Still, this Trackhouse team believed they could win, or at least contend, and Chastain rallied back to finish in the second position once again. And from what I've heard, a lot of people are saying William Byron had the best car. He was the guy to beat. But let's be real here. If Ross Chastain got the help necessary to pass on the entertainment-driven, Super Speedway style configuration known as Trashlanta, he would have smashed more fruits on Sunday than just watermelon. So he still has a goose egg in the wins column, but Ross Chastain has been the breakout star of this young season. He leads the series in top fives, has led the fourth most laps of any driver, and finds himself 10th in the regular season standings, 
even with those two abysmal races to start the season. Meanwhile, in the car number Carl Edwards made his name in, you have Daniel Suarez, the driver many NASCAR fans would say has the lowest ceiling of the Trackhouse twosome. And the reason for that might be because NASCAR fans still have a bad taste in their mouths from a stint at Joe Gibbs and Stuart Haas, even though the 19 team practically hit the rebuild button after Carl Edwards left and the 41 team, looks like they're far and away the worst car on the team. Daniel Suarez was not the problem with either of those race teams, period. His start to the sophomore season is an indication of just that. Daniel Suarez was riding on the freeway to his first career win at Auto Club. Now if only Austin Dillon or Eric Jones would have helped out their Alliance teammate instead of placing the victory right in the lap of the defending champion. That last minute loss hurt a bit, but a 4th place finish and a DQ blizzard I would say is a satisfying consolation. So meanwhile, you have that old NASCAR saying, you either live by the bumper or you die by the bumper, and that summed up the remainder of the wild, wild west for Daniel Suarez. You look at Las Vegas, Chase Briscoe plowed through him as if he were doing farm work with his Mahindra tractor, ending the race for Suarez in heartbreaking fashion. Phoenix, this time he was on the giving end, spreading that sensation by ending Alliance teammate Austin Dillon's solid run to finish in the 8th position. Finally, the Comsco Camaro had great reception, and I'm not saying that because they're an internet provider, but primarily because this car was at the front of the pack all day. Finishing in the fourth position to mark as the second top five of the season for Daniel Suarez. Like Chastain, he also finds himself inside the participation playoff grid with a 13th place points rank and three top 10 finishes. A total that ties him with seven other drivers for the series lead, including his amigo at Trackhouse. And through these first five races, it's safe to say his competitors know his name. My name's Danny, bro. So the Chastain Suarez one-two punches won them a combined five top fives in the first five races. And that means the Trackhouse team leads the league. That is right, folks. They have more top fives than Joe Gibbs Racing, more than Team Penske, and more than Henrik Motorsports, the three-time winners on this campaign. Trackhouse Racing has been the breakout organization of this 2022 season. Now the question is, can it continue and blossom into championship contention? And for that, I want to look back to Kyle Larson in 2021. The five team was predominantly the best team in the first half of the season, but could not close the deal. Then came the 2021 Coca-Cola 600, a race that would begin Larson's hot streak and change his and his team's NASCAR Cup Series career forever. The lesson from that season is, all it takes is one statement victory to open the floodgates and Ross Chastain, I kid you not, has the chance to become this year's Kyle Larson with the speed and the results he and his number one team have shown so far. If he were to go out and win Coda this weekend, it would not surprise me. Though, for the watermelon man, the places where the watermelons need to be protected at all costs are at locations near low banked ovals. I look at his performances at Darlington and Richmond last year. Chastain had a top 5 car in both races, and that stretch was one of the breakthrough moments for this team. Meanwhile, you cannot ignore the inaugural Worldwide Technology Cup race. Few NASCAR Cup Series drivers have ever raced at Gateway, and even fewer have got to race the flat mile and a quarter oval after the repave. Chastain not only has that experience, but remember back to Gateway where he had racing redemption at his hands. The wheel still and perfect, a call to go in the NASCAR Hall of Fame and also remind you that Chastain is one of just two Cup Series drivers to have won under this configuration. For Daniel Suarez, the Bristol Dirt Race on Easter is just a few weeks away and if you remember back to that race last year, that was his breakout performance in the NASCAR Cup Series. He had not had that one instance where he showed his talent. And on a dirt track, a style of racing that Daniel Suarez has never taken part in before that race, he led a bunch of laps and had a car capable of winning that race. He just could not, unfortunately, get it done. Another track I look at for Daniel Suarez to compete is definitely Texas. Unfortunately, it's not in the regular season, but if he is competitive in the playoffs, that could be an ally to him making it far into this season. My only concern for this 99 team, if Trackhouse hypothetically becomes the dominant organization of 2022, which is possible, is that this becomes a Kyle Larson Chase Elliott situation where both are competitive, but it's Chastain stockpiling all the trophies and Suarez hoarding all the ice cream. 
Now I'm sure a lot of people are going to rebuttal against this thinking and I think that is valid. It is ignorant to just assume Trackhouse is going to reach top dog status. You still have Henrik Motorsports, Joe Gibbs Racing, Team Penske, and Sturdos Racing that have all won multiple championships in this business. Trackhouse Racing hasn't even won a race. You cannot be a championship contender without winning a race, though Daniel Hemrick last season loves to defer. Another thing to mention and that we cannot overlook is that Trackhouse has to get past the dog days of summer. This was something that caused their demise last season, as if you remember back to their inaugural season, Daniel Suarez, he was within striking distance of pointing into the playoffs. Then a slew of mechanical issues and accidents caused them to have a shoot-style second half sliding as far back as 25th in the final standings. Still, I blame almost 100% of that on good Sam, or should I say bad Sam? That bastard has not been kind to this race team. Sam or no Sam, the abyss of the unknown, known as the next generation car, could cool this team off if Toyota and Ford hit on something that Chevrolet, including Trekhouse, cannot figure out. Regardless guys, Trekhouse Racing is knocking on the door, becoming a serious contender for the 2022 NASCAR Cup Series Championship. If Phil Surgeon as well as Travis Mack keep building and padding the notebook with this car, Trekhouse will keep singing Don't Stop the Party all season long and they will see their dream come to a reality a lot quicker than they and many NASCAR fans expected. So anyways, this is Nathan for NRF Productions signing out and just remember guys and gals, life's a beach and then you drive.